Warning, this episode contains adult language and adult humor. Since when have trumpet players ever been considered adults? If you are easily offended by these types of conversations, consider switching to the oboe. Welcome to the Trumpet Gurus Hang Podcast. I'm your host, Jose Johnson. My guest for this episode is Gary Grant. Gary is an iconic trumpet player whose career has spanned over five decades of playing on chart toppers and blockbusters. As part of the genre-defining Jerry Hay Horns, Gary has played and recorded with a who's who's list of iconic artists. And as a producer, Gary is lending his ears as well as his chops to the musicians you know and love. Plus, he's one hell of a storyteller. So, pour yourself a big glass, pull up a chair, and let the hang begin! Welcome to this episode of the Trumpet Gurus Hang Podcast, and I am sitting here today with the legendary studio master himself, Mr. Gary Grant. How you doing, Gary? I'm fine, Jose. Thank you for having me today. I appreciate it. Hey, man, it is absolutely my pleasure. Um, you, yes, yeah, this, this is going to be my my moment to to uh, fanboy out. You have been one of my greatest inspirations uh, of the past, uh, you know, several decades of my life. So uh, it means a lot to me to be able to sit and talk with you today because, uh, you know, your playing has been inspirational and the people that I know that know you have said, uh, you know, nothing but absolutely glowing things about you. So I'm just excited to, to get a chance to talk with you today. Thank you, Jose, for that. Um, uh, yeah, really never know how many people we touch through music until people like yourself come up and say that we've made an influence in their lives. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's, let's just actually dive right into this. I mean, you have been a mainstay in uh, the, the studio world for some time now. Uh, I, I mean, I first, I I first got hip to you from, from your work in the the late seventies. Um, but uh, you know, was that kind of uh, when when you broke into the the studio scene, or or was it before that? I broke into the studio scenes in uh, in L.A. Um, in 1975, uh, and uh, uh, of course we did. Uh, you know, was it long after that? It took me about a year to get going in L.A. After I moved back from Hawaii. Right. And that's yeah, why I'm, that's where I met Jerry and all the guys and Larry and all those ferocious musicians. Yeah, all your all your partners in crime from from back in the day. So uh yeah, so I mean Hawaii that was um that was some scene out there, you know, with with uh Jerry and and that gang and yourself and and um from what I understand there's just a lot of people that are kind of coming in and out of that area for various reasons so uh um what what did you experience out there in Hawaii besides the the sun and the surf and the bikinis well I was <clears throat> I love the scuba dive but I went over there to play with the uh temptations uh the the supremes and uh with the same contractor that brought Jerry over there and brought Larry Williams and Larry Hall and and a whole uh, mess of people from Indiana. And uh, they were uh, doing the Dick Jensen show. Uh, when I arrived there in Hawaii and I, uh, it was at the Outrigger Hotel and I uh, walked in and, and I heard Jerry playing this vamp. Up to double C's vamp. <laughs> and it was like the 12th show that week, you know. And uh, I said, man, this is supposed to be out in the middle of nowhere. Where did this guy come from? So uh, we became, uh, we gravitated a lot together and, and, uh, and had a mutual interest in music and um and uh yeah it was it was fantastic uh acts used to come in there like sammy davis jr and other people a lot of people come in come in there would come into hawaii and expect 
uh, you know, some kind of uh, Allen band uh, of of just local musicians, and we were all power packed in there. And uh, uh, at that time, they would um, a lot of you know we had a couple of times where Don Costa came over, and he said he just. He just left Las Vegas, and he said the relief band was over there playing this show, and, and he, they came over, and uh, it was the new Dick Jensen show, and we sight read it, and he said, my God. <laughs> he said, this is unbelievable to have a band out here in the middle of nowhere that sounds this good. So, uh, you know, we knew, we knew we were to be reckoned with, and we were all uh, uh, studious in our and our learning, you know, and practicing and writing and doing all kind of stuff, you know. It was very active. It was great. Really yeah. good. Yeah, well, it was definitely the, the start of decades of working together for you and Jerry and those guys. Um, so you move back from, from Hawaii and you uh, get back to the mainland and uh, start uh, start that prodigious career. Um do you miss the island? Of course, it's uh, it's uh, paradise. You know, uh, you know, I get up and uh, uh, go diving in the morning, scuba dive. You know, and and swim miles and stuff with tanks and you know doing stuff. And um, uh, you know, it was just a great way. Uh, you know, to get salt on you and get the ocean and get into into nature, and um, and then we play shows at night. There wasn't much recording there. I did an album with Trummy Young when I was over in Hawaii, the trombone player that was with uh, Louis Armstrong, yeah, cool. and uh, recorded an album there. And I did the Aloha from Hawaii with Elvis, um, and uh, that was. Uh, 1973 and uh, so uh, except for that there wasn't any recording it was all live playing it was all shows and and uh, I was I had a um, I was part of a group called Tantalus which was a uh, like a, a three horn jazz group with a singer and then I had a, a big band called the Mother Smucker's Booms Farm Band. Oh, okay. And it was like a 22-piece band. Mm -hmm. And I had, you know, the trumpet section was me and Jerry and Larry Hall and and uh, a couple of guys that would come in and out. Uh, uh, and, you know, so the nucleus of the band was all really great players. Yeah. And uh, Dave, Dave Baptist played trumpet there. And, had Les Benedict and Ira Nepis and just a whole bunch of uh, Gay Baltazar and Larry Williams, Kim and Bob Wilson playing drums and Kim Wilde playing bass and and uh, we just tore it up, you know. <laughs> man, I, I would love to hear some recordings of that. Man, there was there was a few of them that um, uh, that we made. You know, of course, they were all live off a cassette player out in front. It wasn't any. Yeah that wasn't in the in the cards in those days you know just uh but um uh it was a really great experience we were making a lot of music yeah wow so uh, was was it your intention to become a uh, you know a, a studio player uh or or was it that, that was just kind of like the natural trajectory that your career took uh, I, you know, my dad, I'm fourth generation of musicians and my, my dad used to just, uh, he was a band director and, uh, and he played with, uh, Trummy, Trummy, uh, excuse me, Tommy Dorsey and Duke's band. He was with the Rindon Brothers Circus Band before the fire. And, uh, he played out on the road. He was, and then he became a, a school teacher. My mom said, you got to come home and help me with these kids. <laughs> so my dad did, and he, he taught himself to play all the instruments. He was a very, very good musician. And, you know, I grew up with Freddie and Louis Armstrong and, and uh, uh, Art Tatum and, you know, the, all those kind of records, plus the classics, too, you know, in my home. So 
I had a good, solid background of music in a, in a very small town. So my dad had Tourette's. And so as a teacher, uh, even in, you know, in the public system, uh, it was a challenge. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he always, you know, we'd stay at a town maybe five years. And then, uh, you know, it would, it would get, they, they were afraid to hire him at first because he would have these uh, verbal out, outbursts. And, uh, you know, I mean, the word bitch would come out occasionally and, uh, <laughs> you know, in front of uh, students, you know, but they, they, they would laugh the first day, but after they got to know him, they, the laughter disappeared and never laughed at it. They just accepted it for what it was. And because he was all about the music and about uh, them listening to each other and playing together. Right. So, uh, you know, um, that my dad always, you know, said the, the best gigs or the best jobs was doing studio work because uh, you could live in a, you could live in a one place instead of being a, a uh, being on the road, nice. being a road rat. And, that, you know, I did that too. You know, I went on the road with Woody's band and did, did other bands. But uh, in, a, in uh, New York or L.A. or Chicago or Miami or one of the big cities, you could make a living uh, playing your music and not have to be away from your family. So that always attracted me. And plus, uh, musicians would come from all over the world, uh, especially in Los Angeles and New York, to to play uh, with other orchestras and all that kind of stuff. You know, so it was it was attracting that way. Right. Cool. Well, I mean, like you said, you uh, you did spend some time out on the road. You did do do uh, do your road dues. Um, and of course, being uh, around in that time when there were still big bands that were that were touring, um, that had to be a lot of fun. Uh, good education. That was man. It's, I'm so sorry that that doesn't uh, happen. Uh, like you know, things are not going to go back to that. We the, the norm is not ever going to be here. We are into a new paradigm, into a new existence. Uh, the the music is there's such wonderful musicians out there, but they're not they're not going to have um, the way I see it. Uh, you know the 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 bands that came up through the '40s, they're gone. Yeah, they were great. They were they were the best. I mean, I've had I've had Basie. I stood out in front of Basie one night and just my jaw was resting on the floor the whole evening. It was just such a wonderful. Uh, a, a band and, and of course Duke's band and Buddy's richest band you know I heard Chuck when he was 18 17 18 years old there and I said my lord of mercy Hell <laughs> and, yeah. uh, you know and heard that band with him and Bobby Shue and and those guys were tearing it up you know and then you know I was studying with Bud Brisboy uh this is when I was in the Navy and uh Studying with Bud Brisboy, so I was tagging along with him with the junior Neophonic. He was doing a lot of feature stuff, plus his own, uh, you know, appearances as a as a trumpet player. And uh, uh, I was in the Navy with um, and listening to uh, uh, Ozzy Matthews. I was in No Folk, Virginia. And I was listening, and, and we had a record player, and, and we just kept playing Flamingo over and over and over again. Some guy had a record of it. And I was just uh, just flabbergasted at the way Bud played. And, uh, uh, and when I came out on the West Coast and did two tours of duties to Vietnam, um, between those being on a ship and everything between those uh, excursions to the Gulf of Tonkin, uh, I would study with Bud Brisboy. I'd 
take a bus or whatever, you know, and go find him. And, and he had me play in uh, like Dizzy Gillespie books. It was a book called World Statesman, which uh, had uh, uh, about eight tunes on it. And it had transcribed solos of, of, uh, of, of Dizzy solos and a little uh, a record that you could hear how he played it. And that's mainly what I studied was lead playing. And also, of course, Bud had his own books and his own routine. But it was a really good uh, uh, training for becoming a lead player and doing that kind of work because of Dizzy's range and the, and the way and the, and the swing bebop, you know, and the, the, the best lead players, uh, including uh, Snooky <laughs> at the very top, is uh, they're all jazz players. And so, uh, you know, that, that, was, that was before uh, Hawaii and all stuff. This is when I was 18 to 22 years old. Yeah. And studying and doing that business. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's, that's a really interesting statement you made about, you know, like, uh, Snooky, uh, who's one of my all time favorite lead players, um, that, that playing lead, a lot of people just think about, well, you, you just gotta be able to play the high notes. Well, you know, obviously that, that's, that's part of the gig, but the style is so important. Your ability, especially if you're playing with a big band, you know, if you're playing lead, you really got to be able to swing and you really have to have the feel, um, because you're, you're basically driving the bus. So when you think about, um, the way that you, you brought, you were brought up in that kind of, uh, lead playing, uh, environment, do you, do you feel that that was really helpful to you as a session player, since you do have to be able to go in and you never know what you're going to have in front of you and just your ability to, to, uh, switch styles and, and to be able to lock in. Absolutely. Uh, and you know, uh, we, we were sort of like, um, uh, the big prostitutes of the recording industry in uh, Los Angeles, you know, our, our slogan was say yes to everything. And, <laughs> <laughs> and a couple of times it got me in the mess of trouble, but most of the time I came out okay, you know. You know, you might go in and do a, I did a jingle once and, and, a, uh, and, a, and I walked in and it was like, guy, the writer says, I've been listening to Herbert L. Clark all week. And he says, and I wrote you a solo, you know, it was, it was, it was only about two minutes long, but it was loaded with uh, technical, you know, <laughs> uh, stuff, you know, and it was, um, uh, it'll get your attention, you know, you, 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 you're always under that umbrella in the studio work is that you're only as good as your last note. They have a lot of fear in it. So, um, you know, you, and, and being prepared and, and, you know, and uh, being prepared with your instrument and stuff, you know, is sometimes, you know, playing it with some big band and, until uh, two or three in the morning and then getting up and doing a French movie call, French music at 9 a.m. And, and it's just like you, you, you just want to be able to get this thing to vibrate you know, yeah. and play yeah. soft, and <clears throat> you you have to approach it and and, uh, and and have your act pretty well together or you, or you won't be called back, you know, right. that is true. So, you know, I, I did, um, uh, yeah, so it was, it was uh, uh, a challenge, you know, it's different music every day. Yeah. So, it's not something that you, uh, you know, it, uh, prepared for. You're prepared for having to play something that is somebody else's imagination of what it should be and, uh, and, and somehow pulling it off where it sounds good, mm -hmm. really comes off great. And, um, <laughs> Uh, we did a we did a tune with George Duke. Jerry and I did. Where Jer and Jerry, uh, it was George's parts, 
and I think Jerry's parts too. It, always Jerry would would intermingle the writing of and improve it. And uh, <clears throat> we did this tune for George Duke that was like took us three hours, which is a long time in those days to record one tune. Right. And it was really really. Uh, loaded with notes and skips and jumps and it was power packed and it ended up on double B's and it was just ridiculous, you know, and then George got the, um, I think it was the, uh, the soul, soul train awards or it was uh, one of those award shows and he was the MD and this was going to be the theme song live. So now this wasn't going to be pre-recorded like we were going at it, you know, rolling up our sleeves and going at it. This is going to be live. And I went over to George. I said, George, George, please, please, man, can we do something else? <laughs> it was really that different. And he said, he looked at me and he says, you the cats. <laughs> Well, you know, you, you built your reputation, so you got you got to live up to it, man. And he said that I laughed, man. I said, "Oh, well, okay." You know, and yeah. we did. We played the holy piss out of it, you know, and it was great. Yeah. Well, you know what? There's there's kind of a love hate relationship that that I have, and many trumpet players have with with you and Jerry and and Chuck. Um, because of all the stuff that you guys have done that we're playing in cover bands and going, how in the hell did these guys do this? You know, uh, you know, it, it, because any horn band, you know, you're going to be playing a lot of Earth, Wind & Fire and Michael Jackson and, you know, that sort of stuff from, from the day. And, man, just some of that stuff was just, I, I it, it boggles my mind how you guys actually pulled that off. So, you know. It was right after New Year's Eve, and you know how when the New Year starts, you start saying, man, man, this year I am really going to get better. I am going to improve my etiquettes, my, my, uh, uh, my personality, my approach. I'm, got, I'm not going to be such a, because I was sort of a renegade, not even sort of, I was a renegade. And, and so was uh, uh, Chuck. And, uh, and they, the town uh, tolerated us a lot because uh, we were on so many hits, you know, that they would uh, tolerate a lot of, of uh, I think it was Alfred Newman that was doing the Academy Awards and, and they had like, rehearsals for two days two or three days and the first day chuck comes in about 10 minutes late he's the only one late he's playing first trumpet then the next day he comes in about 20 minutes late and he's <laughs> scooting over and getting in his chair and uh alfred newman looks at him and says boy you must have a lot of money <laughs> and it's just a it wasn't that Chuck was uh, um, uh, not responsible. He was just getting from one date to another. And in Los Angeles, it's just not that easy at times, you know, because right. he was busy every, every day. And so was Jerry. And I was too. And, uh, but uh, those guys were, were the horses, Jerry and Chuck. Man, I, I, God must be looking on over me and saying, "Hey, Gary, you're going to have a, uh, a a really great career because I'm going to put you with these other trumpet players." And that's what it was. It was just, uh, I, I, it was. I knew that that's where I was going to learn the most and have the most fun. Yeah, you know. And uh, and it was it was it was seriously fun, you know. Oh, yeah, I I can only imagine. Um, it, in I think the thing that that really impresses me about that situation is that you have three guys who were playing together, who each of you are, are you know just a really really talented uh, you know exceptional lead player. Um, but to be able to play not only to play together 
and uh, to work together and, uh, you know, everybody understands their parts and, you know, it's like you guys almost had one mind when you listen to the, the recordings and you know that you guys are just so in sync and there it didn't seem to be any kind of ego or one-upsmanship coming in into play. So, uh, I mean, the fact that you guys worked together for so long shows that there had to be something a lot deeper than just getting a paycheck. It was never about the paycheck. And that's what's ironic about the whole career. It was never, ever about about the paycheck. It was always about the music. And I think that's a lesson within itself is that, you know, nobody likes to be lowballed, especially if you can play. Nobody, and I'm not saying that, but being in the position that we were in, it was it was about the music and, and it was about, of course, making the best living we could, but uh, it was never obvious that way. Never stuck out in front, boy. They just knew that that uh, if it sort of preceded us, that if you wanted us, you were going to have to pay. So we were, uh, again, lucky, you know. And uh, another important thing about this whole thing is, is the feel and the conception of the music. Uh, Chuck is unbelievable. He's a wonderful jazz player and monstrous lead player. And on any part, uh, he can play any part and blend and whatever and go with whatever. And he's, he's like, really doesn't have an ego that gets in the way. Never did. He could care less, you know. He would walk in and... Uh, Jerry and I would usually beat him to the date and uh, I'd sit on second or third or and me and Jerry would take the lower books and here comes Chuck, you know? Yeah. Oh, God. oh guys, no, 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 no. It's, come on, Chuck. Get in there, you know? And we did that out of respect to him because he was, uh, uh, he was just, he was a high stallion, man. And Jerry wasn't no slouch. Jerry could play anything. And uh, and Jerry did that out of respect. And I did too. And um, uh, when you have that much love and respect for each other, magic's going to happen. Mm. And, and, and you say, boy, what a feel. What a feel Jerry Hay gets. I mean, he could sing it with the right syllables, you know, and, and sing it with just perfect time yeah. and and you go like well you know it, you know you, you he could sing it he could play it you know he could write it he could write it and play it and that's more than i can say for 99 percent of the composers that or 99.9999 percent of the composers that we work for and sometimes they like to write things spectacular but that aren't don't sound good. Yeah. And Jerry's things uh, were, were, would become spectacular and sounded great. And yeah. it's the right time and the right judgment of when to do that, you know? Yeah. And, uh, you know, <laughs> uh, there's so many stories, Jose. There oh, really are. Uh, I, you know, I'm, I'm going to ask you about a couple of stories. Um, here in just a second so um okay. mostly because you know part part of what i try to do with the podcast is that you know you're gonna if you're interviewing someone like you like yourself someone who, who who's been in the business for a while you've probably been asked the same questions time and time again i want to ask questions that no, most people don't generally ask so um what I would like to know from you is what is the most bizarre session that you have ever had to play on? We did the Grammys one time where uh, for Ron Fear, uh, and he had produced, God, 
it wasn't Christine Aguilar. It was Aguilar. It was another uh, I can't remember the artist. Anyway, we uh, they had taken he had taken the keyboards and put it down to A432. And I mean, he, they, they, it wasn't his keyboard. He could do that, but it was the right. track that instead of, you know, they had, a, they wanted it a little slower. So they just lowered the pitch and got a little, you know, so okay. that was pretty bizarre is doing that. And, and my tuning slide was at about two inches to start with. And, um, uh, that was pretty interesting, you know. Uh, uh, you know, bizarre, uh, bizarre. There were a lot of bizarres. <laughs> <laughs> it's L.A. I mean, what else do you expect? Uh, the, uh, um, you know, the Earth, Earth stuff was always fun to do. Earth, Wind, and Fire. And... Uh, you know, I've, I, it was about, I did the 25th anniversary of their group, I think in 2014, 2015. And uh, at that time I'd done about 15 records with them, you know, and um, Maurice White walked up to me and he says, Gary, he says, man, you've done so many, this is before Maurice got sick. He says, you've done so many records with us. He says, like, you're a part of the family. And I said, man, that's great, Maurice. I says, what's the chance of me getting one-tenth of one percent of royalties off the record? And he says, you're not that much a part of the family. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, there was, there was like a, a, a lot of uh, a great instances and... Um, um uh a bizarre moment was was um uh, uh, uh ray uh, God, I can't remember his name. anyway i'm not going to tell a story where i can't remember the guy's name at the moment but there was a uh, uh a, a, you know bizarre where you know like uh you mean somebody kicks the 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 uh the ac cable out of the wall and the, and the show stops, that kind of stuff. And, and, well, um, I got, um, I was doing Name That Tune. You remember that TV show, yeah. Name That Tune? Yeah. Well, I, I took uh, Bud Brisbois' place on that, and that was a blow because we would do three shows a day, and the, and the, uh, the first trumpet part went up to F sharps and G's on the theme, and you had to play that, and you do the ending theme, and you, and plus it had all these uh, solos, and it was and it was like if you mess up a melody, and the million dollar name that tune, you uh, the the show could be sued for the contestant, from the contestant. So there was always this fear, you know, you can't mess, mess up anything, can't chip a note. Uh, a piano player went to do the Yellow Rose of Texas and he went da da blub da 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 and, and you couldn't really tell what he played. He was fired after that gig, you know, so that loomed over us all the time, you know. Mm -hmm. And I went over and I went to, uh, and since they did the, Sixty million dollar question. That show, they uh, I'm the the, the uh, uh, million million dollar question. That was it wasn't sixty million. It was a million dollar question that was that had that was rigged in TV. Well, and name that tune. They had federal people that sort of monitored the, the show were in the audience to make sure the tunes ran like the script says and whatever, you know. And, uh, and anyway, I took uh, one of the saxophone players before we went to do the show. He, uh, I got him high. And, um, and of course, he turned his music over because we had a tacit sheet. And then 
he just sort of drifted off and then when the conductor gave the downbeat instead of you know having his tacit sheet up he came in on ba, ba, da, 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 ba, we did it. you know five me to the moon and it was some other tune <laughs> that's that stopped the show you know yeah, there's bizarre yeah. there's bizarre things uh uh, when I went on tour with um, uh, James Lass, uh, Chuck and myself and Slide Hyde went on a tour, a three weeks tour of, of UK. Do you know who James Last is? Yes. Yeah, yeah. He he uh, he was huge over in Europe, you know. And uh, when I got there, the um, Derek Watkins was on the band, and he gave me a brand new. Boozy and Hawks trumpet, brand new, you know, welcome guys, you know. And the third night I was at uh, some stage, we were 12 feet up and I was spinning the trumpet and the screw on the third valve casing broke. And of course, so the horn went flying and it, it, was a, it was a wreck, you know, but the valves were still worked. And and I'm a, I went down to get it. I had to go get my horn. Can't just <laughs> so I'm out there, and and Hansi James Last comes over with my mouthpiece and he says, "Keep it in. <laughs> it's great. This is a great part of the show. Keep it in the show." And uh, and and nobody really cared. They really treated us great there, you know. And so you know you just incidences of uh, bizarre stories and stuff that happens to you yeah 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 you know that's, that's great i would have loved to seen that the you know the, the, the flying trumpet um so you you've uh, you know over the years you know you, you've you've worked with so many great acts i mean you've already talked about a, a number of them but did you ever have uh like one of those oh shit moments like i can't believe I'm working with this person. With Snooky, I had that feeling, you know. I also was doing the comic relief, I think number I did number one and two and four or something, and then didn't do the other ones. But uh I was doing it was just like one trumpet and it was pretty exposed and they had uh, a thing that uh, is either uh, from New York that Doc Severson had played on It's Only a Paper Moon. And Doc was playing that up to high Fs and he sounded so good. He sounded so good on, and I'm on stage and they say, guys, just play, make like you're playing it. And I says, you got it. <laughs> <laughs> and it was Doc, you know, he sang us so great on that, you know. And, uh, and other times we did that, we did it with, we did West Side Story with uh, uh, some specials that were, we did West Side Story with uh, Barbara Streisand and also did some special shows that were like, almost like pit orchestras, you know, and that, which is a challenge to do, you know, and, uh, uh, you know, live shows like that. I did Broadway for a little, little bit, maybe a year. And then uh, uh, I decided that um, uh, I didn't want to do that anymore and let other guys do that, that were, that needed to work and be in that arena. And, and so uh, I was busy enough recording, and that's really what I wanted to do. I didn't want to go in. Uh, I guess it was Milliken in New York that played on Cats for 18 years. Yeah. God bless him. You know, that's that's a long haul. Yeah, yeah. And and his his pension check is monstrous because of it. It's good. Yeah, because it's steady, steady work, you know, and it, it, you, you know, and that's, uh, um, you know, in later life that pays off, you know, and um, yeah. Well, yeah, I a few years ago, um, I was having a conversation with uh, Rick Baptist, 
and uh, he was talking about uh, the change in the the studio scene there in LA. Um, you know, with so much of the work that has uh, been farmed out to European countries, uh, you know, uh, how how the, do you, have you felt the impact of that? I mean, uh, has has the work slowed down for you? that dramatically over the past, uh, you know, 20 years, let's say, or 10 years, decade, the past decade, as opposed to, you know, what it was like sort of in the heyday that you were playing? Uh, absolutely. There's a, there's a big, <clears throat> big change. And, and when the synthesizers came in and, and then they started using, uh, taking off, um, we, we were doing Alan Silvestri day one day and the keyboard player, uh, walked in and said that uh, he was just on a date and that they said, oh, we got to get the Jerry Hay, Horn, Jerry Hay Horns in on this recording. And he held up a disc that David Foster had given to him and said, you don't need to hire them. I got the Hay Horns right here wasn't 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 the writing they were getting they were getting just our sound and uh that that went on for a while jerry let them know that hey listen you know you you're you're uh, you, you couldn't stop that uh, i think a company even put out the hay horns on uh I tried to put it out and uh jerry had a lawyer contact him and say uh uh take that out because we were offered pretty good taste to make those sounds right as a section you know and you go in you go up and do all this stuff you know and fall yeah. offs and whatever and do licks and stuff and it still had to be compressed and stuff and, and they've gotten a lot better of at it mm -hmm. uh however uh they never got jerry's writing you can't, you can't uh, emulate that. Right. Uh, you can do some things, but his creativity, you can't, you can't uh, duplicate that. So, uh, but uh, if it came down to spending, you know, um, uh, you know, five or six thousand dollars for horns, or ten thousand dollars, depending on the number of tunes. And buying uh, 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 some pals, you don't get that experience with Jerry, but you do save money. Yeah. And then you know, and then as as when I when I came into the business, I was at the, at the tail end of ex musicians were uh, in the music producing record labels executive producers and films and they had depth in their musical background and as the business changed and it went from uh, when Ron Fair was uh, head of A&M and, and uh, Geffen Records he was the president of both companies at the same time. He said, they're giving away the music. And this is 1995. They're giving away the music and selling the t-shirts. So the whole industry was changing. They had NAFTA comes in, came in and took uh, and gave all the music away f uh, for people. And, and so, a lot of people think that pirating music is is uh, is their right, and it really isn't. Yeah. Uh, people spend their lives and their money, and their their family goes without, so they can make records and hopefully uh, make that money back for uh, the the expertise. and And uh, and so the sign of the times with accountants and lawyers and uh, you know, it's the same way now, except it's not record labels, it's the internet. And a lot of people, uh, most people, I'll say, that uh, release a record on the internet 
I'm not going to see any, hardly any money at all. Because if you don't do it in the initial steps, when you go into the digital world to own that music in front and your name, so then when it's distributed to iTunes or CD Baby or Amazon or YouTube or wherever, that it is being distributed from your, from the, you control the big chunk on the bottom. Right. And then, and then of course, it still goes to iTunes and they take what, uh, uh, I don't even know what the percentage is, or CD Baby, I'm afraid to ask. Yeah. And, uh, and and so uh, I was speak, speaking with a guy the other day. He was with had a, a a record he was on, and he wrote part of it, and he had eight million hits on it, and what a, what the, that uh, was in sales, and he made seventy dollars. Uh, Lukather from uh, Toto, the great guitar player, says, "Man, it's a joke. That artists uh, they won't make any money." On, on the internet. So it's gone from the record label, which would take 85% of the time, you know, and if you had a blockbuster, a million sellers, you'd make money. Mm -hmm. But if you didn't, uh, it was all recoup the money and, and some kind of uh, marketing, uh, bookkeeping that, that uh, once a person is signed with a company you used to get about a, I think a standard in the 70s and 80s was around $250,000 to do a record. Because you remember that you didn't, they didn't have in-home studios. Right. And, and it was all, you know, a studio machine was $85,000, you know, with Dolby and stuff like that. And Boards, you know, Neve Boards was a couple of million, you know, and... <laughs> Then you got the studios and you got the microphones and got, so the studios did pretty well, but uh, uh, the cost of it was pretty much valid to make those records. You may be able to put some uh, bonus, signing bonus money in your pocket, but all that money had to be paid back first. So as, as the record labels went to, they, 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 had a chip on their shoulders because they made so much money, Jose. It was ridiculous. Off the artists. Yeah. All of them. Oh, yeah. And, uh, and then, uh, uh, you know, if you, if a standard agreement was 15% for the artist and the producer and 85% uh, for the record label. And, uh, and that's before you get into writers and the ownership of tunes and writing and composition. And so, uh, you know, it was, it was, it's always been hard in the music business for, uh, uh, for musicians just to, uh, and people that think, well, I'm just going to go in there and get a part of that rainbow. Well, you better have some business savvy about you to be able to come out where you can support your family and just play music. And we could do that as studio guys. You know, and none of us except Chuck. Chuck would go out and do appearances uh, all over the world. Uh, but mostly he chose not to do that. He wanted to live with his family, too, with his wife, Celie, and his kid, Derek, and, and uh, the family, and, and, and Jerry, too. We just, you know, we didn't want to leave. Jerry didn't want to leave Quincy. We was having <laughs> a good time with it, you know. Oh, yeah. And, and those guys... It, it was it was like um, the best artists at the time. The tracks were fun to play to. They were all together. You got Bruce Sweetie in. You got all these fantastic engineers. You got the um, people waiting on you at the, uh, the studio, and and uh, and then you got uh, the money's the best. The money's the best. And the producer, you know, you got Quincy sitting there behind the booth. Look out, man. It just don't get any better, you know, as a as a studio hack. It just doesn't, you know. Yeah. And, uh, uh, and, and uh, it was all around a creative process. And those guys were having fun and, and, and uh, deservingly so. Mm -hmm. So Lukather talked about the, the internet 
been uh, where they can't make any money. They get the, 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 the musicians can't make any money. So with the, with the deals uh, with uh, iTunes and, and, uh, and, and CD baby, CD baby was good in the beginning, but not anymore. Not, not to what I understand, you know, they're taking 60% or 70%, maybe higher. And, uh, um, you know, and so uh, that's off of every dollar tune that you sell, you know, and it's, right. it's not, what kind of record is it? Well, listen to it and see what you think. And it's not, they don't go in the bins anymore and it doesn't have to be even a record. It could be, you know, two or three really good tunes and it's always down to the tunes. But uh, if you rush into that agreement too fast, you're not going to uh, receive too much from it. Right. You have to be careful. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I think that um, it, that's, that's kind of always been the thing that uh, the the industry has, you know, taken. I don't want to say taken advantage. I mean, there there's a, there's a level of, of reciprocity, you know, but, um, you know, they're, they're certainly they're certainly making their fair share off of the backs of the people that are doing all the work. So. Um, you know, and, and it gets to be difficult because yeah, you do have to, as you said earlier, you do kind of have to prostitute yourself because, uh, you know, they're, they're, uh, they're taking their cut and they're making sure that, uh, that they get paid. And, uh, so if you, if you want to make a living, you, you've got to really hustle. So I really, I, I, I believe personally, and, uh, I've, I've said this in a number of, uh, episodes that I've talked with people that it should be required you know, if you you know if you're getting a degree in music, uh, and you want to become a professional musician, that you should you should have to have a serious music business course. I mean, I'm not talking about just the generic thing. I, you need to know about finances. You need to know about contracts. You need to know about publishing rights. You need to know about distribution rights, and uh, you really should be diving into that stuff if you really hope to make it in the in the industry. And and especially now in this new new time even even so knowing all that stuff and it's 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 never been set up for the artists you know and just the the way that we we happened into a time you know before us you had the yuan races and you had uh uh, Vince Rosa, and you had other, you know, the crew before us, right? That uh, quit the union and uh, and formed the Gill because they were doing movie calls, and there was no how long they could keep them from the time that they hired them for. They, they didn't have breaks. They didn't have. And you know, a lot of they would take the movie and maybe make a. Uh, another uh, format with the music and wouldn't pay for it. And it just, uh, they, they just ran rampant. And so they formed the Gill and quit the union. And then that's when they formed the new contracts because the producers in Hollywood, and there wasn't other places to go and record. Wasn't Europe, wasn't Canada, wasn't Portland, wasn't Utah, wasn't these other places. And uh, only New York and, that uh, and the the but the center of the movies was in Los Angeles and a lot of records there too, and uh, so they uh, they got what they asked for. They got uh, where the movies you play on a movie and then it would you would get one percent of after the box office after the box office. Whatever sales they did with uh, eight millimeter or, or TV movies or any of that stuff, and, and uh, uh, would one percent of that money would go to the musicians, mm -hmm. and uh, they never have liked that agreement. Right. Never have liked that paying that back in, and it still exists today. Uh, the and then uh, and of course we had residuals on the records. The records uh, were really uh, pretty dang good, except in 1982, 
uh, we went, the, 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 they had a banner year, banner year, they made it billions, the record labels. And then the next year they didn't, and then they, and it was time to renegotiate the contracts with the, the powers to be and, and the uh, union, uh, uh, and it was all a done deal, a sellout under the table deal of, uh, I remember picketing for our, and it, our contract and standing up for keeping the same rates and people that were involved in it said, no, it was done before I ever picked up a picket. Hmm. And, and uh, so, you know, you, you find this kind of corruption and misrepresentation just about in every business. Right. And we certainly weren't of a void of that. And uh, however, and that, that, that money uh, went away. Uh, and they started, uh, instead of paying $25 for every 100,000 records that were sold, sold, you know, and if you get up into, uh, like, off the wall, sold over 5 million copies, where you could get a, a, a check, you know, for two or $3,000, dollars, you know, back then, which was good money. You know, as a part of that pie that made that money, well, all that went away it was $25, period. No matter mm-hmm. how many records it sold. So they took that away from us, and, and things changed. Just gradually ground us, uh, grounded us down. And, and uh, uh, But those, uh, the movies and the records, uh, they, they still had a record fund. I still get paid royalties off of records uh, that were done by contract. Now a lot of friends of mine didn't do didn't do contracts, and there's no way they're going to get residuals without it. You can be on unless you're with the group that's selling it. Mm-hmm. So that was a good thing as a part of the union because they kept those contracts who was on it and monitored the sales of it yeah. uh, and it's been uh, a sort of a, a, we were just there as it was a gift for us we never had to form a guild we never had to uh, uh, go in and make meetings after meeting to figure out how this should pay out to the musicians and at, at that time the Hollywood had the edge in in the musicians had the edge because all the great players, the top hundred players in Los Angeles, quit the union and said, "Well, this is what we want. We want uh, you know a three hour call, and you can keep us over on a record date, fifteen minutes, and you can keep us an extra hour on a movie call, but that's it. You know, you just couldn't just say, hey, guys, we're going to keep you another two or three hours and you have another job as a freelance musician. Right. You know, and I think it was about maybe seven or eight years that they had the uh, orchestras that, that were at MGM, uh, 20th Century, Universal had one, staff orchestras. And, uh, and uh, you know, and that, that's a different story than... And and so the freelance business was hard to figure out sometimes for those guys, and uh, you know it's, it was it, you know hustling. Uh, I I don't think I don't I have never remembered ever Chuck and Jerry hustling. You know, now I have a great set of knee pads. <laughs> <laughs> no. no uh, I, you know, I never, never considered us as as hustlers. I always, I always, I just, the, the our track record just spoke for itself. You know, we didn't have to hustle. We were lucky in that way. But uh, other other guys did do that, and whatever you know, and that's and and it's become more prevalent now as the jobs disappear and people. Uh, the writers are, are less knowledgeable. You don't have uh, Goldsmith. You don't have uh, a lot of these wonderful composers uh, that 
uh, really know their craft. Yeah. You know, uh, Billy Byers, I know he used to go to a, he'd go to a record date and be writing score in his lap on the way to the date and transposing all the, all the saxophone section, all that stuff while he's driving. <laughs> yeah. You know, some serious geniuses in there, yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. Yeah. and, uh, uh, you don't hear much about that anymore. You know, you don't hear hear about that kind of level of, uh, of writers. You know, Jerry's in that in that category. I've mm-hmm. seen him whip out, you know, fifteen tunes and uh, write an arrangement for the tunes, fifteen tunes in an hour, and that's ridiculous. That's nuts. You know? Yeah, it's it's nuts, and. Uh, you know, is get out of his way. You know, mm-hmm. I just get a spray bottle and start spraying him so he keeps cool. <laughs> <laughs> well, you you've made uh, a transition into doing um, uh, more producing. Um, I so, um, I are are you um, happier with that that aspect of of uh, the music or? Uh, yeah, man, because, uh, you know, it's, it's wonderful to, uh, I remember I was doing um, uh, Gio Marco record, he's a, a singer from uh, Venezuela, not Venezuela, but uh, anyway, it, and we were doing um, uh Frank Sinatra tune and the big band didn't just didn't sound good. Just didn't sound good. And I went out there and I pulled a David Page, I mean uh Marty Page, and that's Jesus Christ, guys. This sounds like shit. <laughs> and you know what? Boy, oh boy, they stuck it up my wazoo after that. Let me tell you, they got to it, you know, and and that was fun to do. You know, I saw that transformation of it being what it was supposed to be. They all knew what it was supposed to be. And and we just ran a couple of sections and I said, yeah, that's right. You know, so producing is is fun to be able to get uh, the the uh, the end goal you know, and, and uh, nurture people's uh, dreams, you know, of what they want. I always put the uh, artist, whoever he is, I always let them have a lot of rain. I I didn't do old school um, because these weren't amateurs that I was working with. And uh, so I would let them have a a say-so and and their decisions of, um, from, uh, I produced uh, a lot of stuff for Arturo for uh, 10 years. Right. And, and Arturo's not the kind of guy that you just say, hey, we need, we need, we need another one. And he, Arturo is, wants to play it now and he can play it now, right now. Mm-hmm. And, uh, uh, his, his musicianship is amazing and what he can do. However, uh, sometimes, uh, they, it, you know, rather than saying we need to do that, I would point out what I thought was, uh, you know, it's no, we don't have to put that out and call it jazz. Uh, but and and leave a bunch of uh, nuances, bad, bland playing in it, you know, and uh, so it, it, I would leave it up to our tool. What do you want to do? And he said, Yeah, let's let's do it again, man. You know, and and you know, and he most of the time it was uh, full takes. You know, that's the way he likes to work. And so being able to work with people, Wayne was Wayne as uh, I did three produced Wayne on three records and. He uh, he really always took instructions great, the best of the best, mm-hmm. and uh, and uh, uh, 
you know, that was really a fun. He had a high power band, man. It was, uh, you know, cooking at it and cooking, cooking band and yeah. fun to, fun to produce him. And Wayne is such a fantastic player, man. Boy, yeah. is he a good lead player, man. He really is. And, uh, and, and a very good jazz player. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, I've I've produced about 25, 30 records in my career. Uh, vocalists, uh, rock and roll, uh, country, uh, big band, classical uh, with Malcolm, you know, the Tchaikovsky, Violin Concerto, and the Infinite Trumpet. Um, and doing uh, all that because I could understand uh, the different genres, like yeah. you were talking about in the beginning, and and being able to uh, understand of of uh, who Raphael Mendez was, and and understand who uh, Sergei uh, Sergei Nikolakov is, and Timothy Dockshitzer, and and uh, you know all these guys, and actually listening to them, and being in that world, and being able to read scores, and you know, and uh, uh, do that too, uh, and engineer, yeah. and uh, you know, just and say, I, this this sounds great, or this really doesn't sound. I think this could be better, and this is an opinion, and and I would usually let the artist pick it, pick what he wanted to do. It's his art. It's his record. Right. So I kept them as involved in the production as I could. Right. Always. <clears throat> cool. Cool. Well, you know, I have to ask you this question. I mean, you, you've recorded so many different things. And, um, you know, if, if people really, I mean, there, there are so many things that you've been on that I didn't realize until, you know, I start to, to research a little more. It's like, oh, so that was scary. Um, but I mean, I know I have some favorites of my own that that you've you've done. Um, but if you had to to say to somebody, okay, this represents what I feel is like some of my best work. What's one or two tracks that you feel like are are at the top of your list? You know, I'm involved with a um, Hope Orphanage in Africa, and 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 I've been. Um, you know, a uh, part of their existence of, of food and and uh, and clothing and stuff. And I just sent them <clears throat> some tracks for the first time of Mori Conti. Mori Conti is an African artist that lived in France. And uh, those horns are pretty ferocious on that. You know, uh, just, uh, you know, there's been so many Jose that, of course, the Al Jarreau stuff was a lot of fun uh, to uh, record those tunes. We didn't start those tunes until six, seven o'clock at night. And we were doing like double Brazilian dates during the day. Right. And so, you know, at three and four in the morning, you know, uh, <laughs> it was it was a, a, a lot of come on are you men or what you know yeah. <laughs> and uh so you know it's it's um uh and of course a, a lot of earth stuff george duke was a lot of fun uh mccoy tyner was fun we did the hollywood uh, maynard we did um some serious uh, uh, jazz and, 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 you know, direct to disc records and sheets, mm -hmm. you know, which didn't pay any more. Right. Except that you had to do the whole first side without, st <laughs> <laughs> without stepping in a hole somewhere, you know, yeah. and, uh, and, uh, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, man, it's just, I mean, really, truly, I, I, it's hard for me to pinpoint exactly what is the best of the best or does 
the, the, I mean, Jerry and I did some ferocious stuff together. We did. And, yeah. uh, and we, we took no prisoners and, and, and I remember that a lot of times, you know, we go in and, and Jerry write this arrangement and we usually play it down the first time without uh, stopping just mm -hmm. so the artist would get the gist of the thing, you right. know, and we get into the vamp and it was holy moly vamp. And, and, uh, uh, and about, you know, some of the vamps were longer than the tunes. Yeah. And, and we would be going at it and, <clears throat> and I would be red faced perspiration, man, just pouring off of me just on the rundown. Now, it's not going for recording or nothing. This is the rundown and we get done. And I'd look at Jerry and I says, are you kidding me? And he would, he would be laughing. He would laugh so hard, man. He just, he loved it, man. He, he did, man, because he could do it. He, he was the doer. Yeah. You know, he, it, it was, I guarantee you at the end, Jerry Hay was going to be standing. Chuck Finley was going to be standing and I was going to be standing somewhere or another, you know, I remember we were at, um, at the Astrodome in Houston doing the Stevie Wonder concert with Quincy. And uh, we, Patty Austin had this tune and I was playing lead on it. And on the, on the back end, on the very end of it, it had this high G. And I really got a hold of it. I got a hold of that sucker and I'm holding it. And Right when I'm starting to say, well, you know what? I got this, baby. I'm just going to add a little more to it. And right when I did that, Quincy, he's got his hands up and he's, ladies and gentlemen, give Patty Austin a big hand. He started introducing Patty. We're holding the cord. Yeah. You know? <laughs> and you're holding that G. <laughs> <clears throat> I'm holding that G and I'm starting to hear guys stop playing, you know, under me. They're running out of air. Of course, you know, he, he is, is, if the guy's paying a G down the lower, he's going to run out of air faster. But still, I hung in there to the bitter end, and I made it. However, it was one of the few times that my lights went out. Mm. And when it did, I leaned down and I saw Jerry's belt loop, and I <laughs> hooked my finger into it, to hold on and I'm holding on and I'm shaking like this and everything. But Jerry just took my hand and he went, bam, man, don't be grabbing me like that up here in front of him. That <laughs> <laughs> was the funniest reaction, you know, and man, I straightened right up. I says, okay, <laughs> you know, Oh man. but it was, it was, uh, it was one of those, Things like uh, when Chuck was doing the, the Academy Awards and he was a little inebriated on the show and he was playing, playing the first trumpet part on slide trumpet. And, and at the end, he had a double A flat and just nailed it, peeled paint off the wall and then went like, just sort of, <laughs> that, was, that was it. <laughs> and the contractor said, Chuck, you can't do this. You cannot work and do this. And Chuck looked at him and says, well, I made it, didn't I? <laughs> and he did, you know. Yeah. So yeah. Those were the good old days. Fearless family, he was that. Not, it wasn't that Chuck was like that. But in the early days, in the early years, you know, we would uh, uh, celebrate sometimes too much. And uh, we were having a good time, man. Yeah, and, well. There's, there's nothing wrong with that. Well, we're gonna, we're going to um, switch gears here. I mean, I could talk to you for for decades because you've got so many stories. Um, but uh, I know you, you know your time is limited, and so um, I want to do. I was uh, end of every episode, we do a speed round. Uh, so uh, there's a variety of questions. They're going to be all over the place, and I just want your quickest answer, short, quick, and we'll see how this one goes. Okay. 
All right, here it goes. First question, who's the biggest influence in your life that is not a trumpet player? God. All right. What's your favorite book? Wisdom Codes. Very good book. I read that one. Uh, what's the worst movie you've ever seen? Uh, Blue Boy. <laughs> I don't know if I want to know about that one. Uh, no, if, <laughs> if you weren't a trumpet player, uh, what would you want to be? Uh, a, a jet pallet. What's your favorite drink? Um, cranberry and um, orange juice. Mm, refreshing. Uh, you could have a dinner party. You could have a dinner party and you can invite any three living people to join you at that dinner party. Who would you want to have there? Well, you mean that would accept? Well, no, just do that. <laughs> no, okay. <laughs> no, no one's going to accept. <laughs> well, actually, if they're musicians, they'll accept if it's free food. So we know. <laughs> yeah, right away, right? Uh, let's see. Uh, three people uh, would be my son and my daughter, and um, and uh, my roommate Charlotte Blevins. Okay. Uh, you at that dinner party, you're going to have three additional guests. They could be any three people from history. Oh, man. Uh, I'd love to, uh, to hang out with Louis. I, I saw him play a, love, a, a few times. I'd love to uh, give a hug to Freddie. Uh, you know, again, I would. And uh, I would uh, uh, Snooky. That, was, that would be a three good people for me to have a hang with her. That would be a great hang. All right, lacquer plated or raw? Uh, plated. Okay. What's your favorite quote? Why you ate one too. <laughs> What's your greatest fear? Uh, is that I don't address my fear. All right. You're going to be granted a superpower, any one superpower. What would you want that superpower to be? To be, to have, to really truly be non judgmental. Mm. That would be very helpful at this point in our society. <laughs> Um, what aspect of trumpet playing do you feel is the most overrated? High notes. And what aspect do you think is the most underrated? Uh, the beginning and the releasing of notes. All right, you're able to go back in time and give your younger self one piece of advice about music, what would it be? I would think that uh, learn more about melodies. Learn melodies better. Mm -hmm. You know, as uh, growing up, especially as a player, you're playing around the melody for the most part. I mean, I, of course, I did all the, learned main, mainly all the uh, main standards. Yeah. But, um, uh, you know, just from that aspect, it's back in the back row kind of part of the arrangement of stuff and, and uh, focusing on drums and bass and guitar and pitch and time and feel as opposed to uh, the words and stuff like that. So that's what I mean by that. Okay, yeah. Cool. All right. What advice would you give your younger self about life? Um, have a lot of laughs. Have a lot of laughs, man. Yeah. yeah. All right. And the final question, what do you want your legacy to be? Uh, that I was compassionate and uh, I 
I cared about my fellow man and fellow humans and, uh, and showed that to the best of my ability. Yeah. Well, that is something to live up to. And, uh, I have to say, Gary, that it's been an absolute pleasure for me to talk with you. Uh, as I said uh, at the, the start of this episode, that you've been a huge inspiration for me as a trumpet player. And uh, everything I've heard about you as a person uh, is ringing true as well. And you are an inspirational person as well. So uh, you seem to have a, a lot of love for life. And uh, you've had a great career. And you still have got years ahead of you man so uh i'm in <clears throat> thank you jose for that man because uh I, I am still playing i play every day uh i'm not so much in the recording uh scene in los angeles i don't even live in los i don't live in los angeles a anymore and uh uh the uh but i do play every day and i have a recording studio in my home and i uh, recorded some really tunes, uh, tunes that I'm really excited about and close to my heart and uh, that I've written and, you know, done stuff with. So it's, I'm still in the music, but I'm not uh, uh, doing, I mean, where the music business is right now, you have to get a COVID-19 test <clears throat> before you go into Fox. And then you can't, you know, you're 10 feet away from uh, the, the next player and uh, you can't put your spit on the floor and, you, you know, <laughs> you know, and it's just all these uh, added obstacles yeah. that, uh, well, and, you know, listen, if you're playing live with other guys, it, it, that's the main thing anyway, but it's gone, it's gone to a very trying time for musicians and artists. And I just like to say, follow your dreams, follow your heart. Don't, don't let this bog you down. It, it's gonna, it's, this too shall pass. And we're gonna come out into a world that is not like it used to be and it's not like yesterday, it's not. And it's being in the now and creating the future from the now. And so let your dreams flourish to anybody that's doing this and uh, uh, fo follow your heart, man. And it's Absolutely. wide open. Nothing has changed. It's always been difficult. Yeah. And uh, so this is, this is all going to turn out great. I mean, unbelievable. Great. Believe me, trust me on that. Everybody that the world is, uh, is in really, really, really great hands. Yeah. We are not at war in any country to another country at all. And that's a big thing. Yeah. Yeah. Jose, I, man, I sure appreciate you letting me to get in this a bit at the end and, and asking me, I'm humbled that you asked me uh, to be a part of this because you know, out of Jerry and Chuck uh, and so many players, one learning and, and, and uh, Wayne Bergeron and Dan Finnell and all these people, Johnny Adino and Snooky Young and all these people I've recorded with, you know, I always felt uh, I was lucky to be there. And uh, so, uh, you know, uh, I wasn't afraid of it, but I, I knew these guys and I held them in such high esteem that that's, I think that was good for me. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, well, pre I appreciate you asking me to do this. Oh, man, I appreciate you and, you know, your contributions uh, to the world of music and just to the world in general, because, uh, you know, we just need more good people. So, you betcha. You know, all right. Well, Gary, thank you so much for spending time with me and thank you for listening or watching and as the case may be. And remember, make sure that you like, subscribe and share to the show and uh, see you the next time. Peace and slide grease. We're out. Hey, thank you so much for hanging with us today. This podcast is all about creating connection through our mutual love for the trumpet life. I hope that you learned a few things about today's guest and had some laughs along the way. 
Don't forget to give us a review. We love those five-star ratings. And please share this podcast with your friends. We want to see our hang grow for show. Have a suggestion for a future topic or a guest? Hit me up at thetrumpetgurus at gmail.com. Our opening theme was written and performed by Lexi Signor, and all other music comes courtesy of The Greatest Funeral Ever. So in the words of W.C. Handy, life is like a trumpet. If you don't put anything into it, you don't get anything out. So go out there and let your trumpet sound, and I'll see you at the next hang. <laughs>